Congratulations. So once again, um, good evening, everyone. Good morning from wherever, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, thanks again for joining in. Um, special thanks to Dr. Sanjay Prabhu and uh, Dr. Bijay Thomas uh, for uh, joining our session as their guest expert panelists. Uh, we have around um, eight or nine cases, uh, pretty interesting cases. Uh, some of them are complex. So we'd like your help in the chat session, chat box. Um, any answers, any questions or queries, uh, please feel free to go to the chat and um, put in your comments. We'll start off with our first case. Um, it will be from Rainbow and Prithuja, over to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. We have a one year, four months old uh, female child with born to non consanguineous marriage with no postnatal complications, now presenting with Caesar since four months of age. Initial episodes of Caesar was left-sided focal Caesar, which was controlled with medication after two months. So it started at four months. By six months of age, it was controlled. At six months of age, she started developing myoclonic spasms, initially three to four episodes in a day. And then it started occurring in clusters, which was poorly controlled despite anti-Caesar medication. And she was already on five anti-Caesar medications for the myoclonic spasms. She has a history of developmental delay at the time of presentation to us at one year, eight months of age, one year, four months of age. She had no neck control. She was not able to roll over. She had difficulty in sitting when made to sit and she was not reaching out to objects, making sounds, recognition of the parents by sound that also occasionally noted by the parents. And she was on ketogenic diet as the myoclonic spasms were poorly controlled with five anti seizure medications. All right. Anything on the <coughs> child, face, limbs? Uh, so, as we can see, uh, the, there was a dystonic kind of posturing that was present. And uh, uh, she had, uh, I'll discuss the other ones in the examination. Um, well, I don't have an examination slide, um, so. Oh, sorry. Uh, for this child, the head circumference was uh, 42.5. On the lower side, low, and there was no light perception. Uh, the eyes are covered. The, she had a convergence squint that was present. No specific dysmorphism was noted. She had severe head lack and generalized hypotonia was there. Uh, DTR was elicitable, but the angle, she had sustained ankle clonus that was present. She was evaluated outside with the uh, investigations done in the form of EEG, which was done in the first episodes of uh, Caesar, that was uh, showing hips arrhythmic pattern. Uh, repeated after two months was normal. Vision test was also done, that was normal. Uh, and we go forward with the MRI images that was done. Okay, uh, there was a mention of pushing guard features. Um, anything on the face? Um, slightly uh, subcutaneous fat is normal for a child. Slightly noted, sir, but a specific okay. kind of okay. good features. Yeah. Got it. All right. Uh, so this child um, then went on to have an MRI. Um, so the child actually came with a genetic diagnosis, and uh, we were asked to reverse phenotype and check for the images if they correlate with the gene. Um, so I'll first go ahead with the uh, MRI description. We have the T2 axial sequences over here, and you can appreciate that the head is small. There are widened subarachnoid spaces over there. Slight asymmetry in the cerebral hemispheres. The left cerebral hemisphere, is, as you can see, is slightly smaller than the right side. The ventricles are dilated and slightly plastic. Um, if you come and check over here, the basal ganglia also slightly up thickened and abnormal in morphology. And you can appreciate that there is extensive, um, slightly milder variant of polymicrogyria along the bilateral cerebral hemispheres, extending from the frontal regions to up to the parietal lobes, so related spreading in the occipital regions, but um, overall uh, diffuse. Uh, malformation of particle development. And when it comes um, inferiorly, there is uh, the brainstem uh, appeared relatively normal in comparison to, comparison to the supratendral structures. There was slight asymmetry again on the left side. Um, you can see appreciate over here, the left half of the midbrain and the pons is slightly reduced in the caliber and compared to the contractile side. But there were no um, abnormalities in terms of uh, cerebellar dysplasia or clefting per se. And as you can see over here at the level of the uh, middle cerebral peduncles, the cerebral hemispheres are normal. Possibly slim degree of um, increase in the interpolar space along the vermis, a mild degree of atrophy over there. 
and then we have corroborate that with the T1 wave sequences. And again, you can I don't know if you can appreciate it or not, but there is polymetric area again on bilateral uh, frontal parietal regions, extensive uh, malformation in the bilateral hemispheres. Again, asymmetry of the left is slightly smaller than the right. Uh, basal ganglia again slightly abnormal over there. Uh, but again, coming to the posterior fossa, especially on the sagittal images, we can appreciate that the morphology is intact. Uh, there is no volume changes. The corpus callosum is formed, but again, it's slightly thinned out, uh, possibly mild dysplasia again, but not. Uh, but it was completely formed and there was no hypogenesis or agenesis. On the SWI sequences, there were prominent uh, peripheral veins, but uh, nothing significant to suggest possible hemosiderin deposition or calcification in the intraparenchymal region. And on the coronary sequences, uh, there was some increase in subcutaneous fat in the face on the cheeks on both sides. And again, you can appreciate the uh, supratentorial malformation and slightly relatively normal uh, posterior fossa or cerebellar structures in terms of the malformation. At this point, uh, what one think of is the possible trypanopathy. Uh, again, I was uh, biased because the gene was uh, given to me before seeing the scan. So again, some features shared in this, uh, in this case were the abnormal basal ganglia. They can also have particle malformations, abnormal corpus callosum. But the feature that was um, is typically known to be seen in the tubulinopathy spectrum disorders was the asymmetry on the clefting of the brainstem structures, which was not seen in our case, but not always. But yeah, this feature was not seen in our case. And, um, but rest of the features, the supertental malformations, uh, central abnormalities can be seen in uh, tubulinopathy. I will reveal the gene and the gene which was um, had come out was green 2B. And then we are asked to check if the imaging matches with the uh, genetic mutation. And then we looked at cases of green 2B mutations and these are papers from the Dobbins group. And you can see that the imaging findings are pretty similar to what we have seen in our case. And what they are described in their paper were they have significant clinical and imaging overlap with the tubulinopathies, but the brainstem uh, cerebella structures were abnormal in tubinopathies, whereas they were relatively normal in the green one and green two B mutation disorders. Again, the main imaging features, the supratentral structures can be similar to tubulins, but the infratentral lesions for abnormalities were absent in six cases uh, published in across two papers. And you can appreciate that there was some degree of asymmetry also in this lower panel case. The genetics, and this was a genetic report, we do that if you want to just... Uh, <clears throat> So uh, the pathogenic variant was noted in the green 2B mutation in exome 13, and it was an autosomal dominant heterozygous mutation. And coming to the uh, phenotype, the, we had a match with the green 2B mutation with the clinical manifestation as well as the MRI findings. Uh, the other mutation that was noted was the SCN2A, which was of a uncertain significance. So hence the diagnosis of green 2B mutation was met. I want to make something uh, this one. As sir mentioned that there was some Cushingoid features, maybe that was because of the steroids that was used a month back, but it was already tapered and stopped one month back. So, so now I'll open the case uh, if anyone has a similar um, imaging experience or clinical experience with this mutation. Yeah, I'll probably go first if that's okay. Um, so yes, yeah, the green two B uh, when you in the tubulopathy, the uh, um, overlap is is there definitely there. The dysplastic basal ganglia. The uh, other thing is uh, looking at the cortex itself. I know it looks like this, uh, you know, puckering of the cortex and looks polymacrogenic on the outside. But if you look at the cortical thickness itself, it looks a bit odd. Uh, I wonder in some areas there is that just packaging area or like yeah. or yeah. I think then, there's yeah. Um, also, some like the gyration is a little simplified as well, especially posteriorly, anteriorly. Again, tubulopathies will do that too. But green two B overlap is quite, uh, you know, it's, it's described as uh, as an overlap, but you know they look very similar. Um, and the other thing is um, the SCN SCN mutation that's not pathogenic. The pathogenic was there anything in that? Was a I, I missed that on the last slide. I think you mentioned no, it was uh, because even that certain. has a very uh, heterogeneous, uh, you know. Um, uh, the MRI findings can be heterogeneous across the SC and 2B um, and 2A and 2B. You can get lots of different things which look, which you can then go back and say it, 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 it is there in this. But the green 2B, I think, uh, if you think about that, along with the um, tubulinopathies, uh, when it's not exactly that's within tubulinopathy, uh, you should think of the uh, green 2B 
and that just seems to be a good case for that. Um, Got it. All right. Thanks, Indra. Nihal, that uh, brainstem asymmetry, is it a part of the uh, dysplastic uh, process or is it just a valerian degeneration in this case? In this case, I think it's valerian degeneration because I think supratentor also, um, the hemisphere over there was um, slightly asymmetrical or reduced, if you see over here. Okay. And especially on this image. So I think that is, I think, valerian degeneration rather than um, cross asymmetry or uh, fusion or the clefting which you see in diplomacies. I think the olfactory bulbs probably also are hypoplastic, at least on that x axial slice, you don't see anything, and the olfactory bulbs should be kind of interesting. I've been looking at these for lots of malformations, and it seems to be um, a feature not usually described. So, so we had shown this case uh, at the Dobbins meeting, which is at which occurs every Wednesday. I think Sanjay, uh, I think you attend some of these meetings. and. Um, yeah, Professor Dobbins also initially did not get the diagnosis, uh, so it just shows how uh, difficult it is to diagnose this case. But both papers were his, and uh, he then agreed that this is a pathogenic match uh, with the evaluation of cerebral asymmetry. If it's an antenatal insult or it's a feature of the gene to be, uh, which needed to be uh, seen, I think, in more cases. How's the kid doing now? Yeah. Just, <clears throat> this was on the recent follow-up. They had presented a month back. She still is having the myoclonic spasms a bit reduced, but uh, but we are not uh, now follow-up is not there. So they will come and follow up with after doing the physiotherapy. Okay. And all. So um, just uh, so Pranay Deo, he is the father of the kid. Uh, he was he has requested to join, and she. Yes, mentioned the comment that still is still like a newborn kid. So yeah, so I think development delay is still there. And the uh, spasms are around every six to seven times a day. All right. Thanks, Pane. Um, hope the child um, recovers or progresses. Clinically, too. There's a question from Sai Deepak. What changes do we see in SCN mutations? Uh, Sai, I think we have a case of SCN uh, in the follow up cases, so maybe we'll discuss that over there. Uh, uh, Prithuja, phosphasm, what are you using? Any medications? You can just answer the chat so that we can move on to the next case. Uh, we are uh, you uh, child is on valparin pronouncer, lamotrigine, clonitrol, and VB uh, Sorry, Vega battery is being used. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, to our next case. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Ah, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. My thirteen year old. Uh... Boy born third issue of a non consanguineous marriage with normal perinatal and negative family history with intellectual delay. Uh, he is having drug refractory epilepsy from seven months of life. Uh, he is having inadequate control on multiple AEDs. Currently, he is on valparin and cesium. He is to get uh, seizures like staring look with GTCS type of seizure lasting maximum up to one minute. And he used to, it, it used to occur two to three times in a month. On examination, he is having microcephaly. He is hyperactive. Intellectual disability is present, and uh, he is spastic, crouched gait, with mild, with mild cognition issues as well. And all the cerebellar signs are positive, and uh, deep tendon reflexes are present. Uh, his beta and vision are all normal, and he, he showed background asymmetry with epileptiform discharges over uh, both the temporo occipital region, right more than the left. 
So when the uh, MRI was done two times, sir, one at eight months of age and other at uh, six years of. Okay. Um, yeah. So the first images are not very clear. Um, so apologies for that. This is from 2010. And you can see in com if you have seen the first case, there are some features which are um, some, some, somewhat similar to the index case or the first case. Again, you can see that the basal ganglia are abnormal, dysplastic, the lateral ventricles are abnormal. Uh, cannot appreciate any polymicrogyria or uh, pachygyria, but um, possibly you'll see that on the follow-up case. Um, coming down in patenturally, there's possibly some um, normality in the foliation of the vermis over there. And if you see, Adin, the there's asymmetry of the brainstem. Um, and if you see on the inferior aspect in the medulla, you can appreciate that there is the base, the medulla is dysplastic in comparison to the first case, possibly some cerebral dysplasia, but again, the images are not very clear. Um, yeah, so those are the main findings. The basal ganglia abnormalities, the lateral ventricles are uh, dysplastic and dilated, uh, and also brainstem abnormalities with possibly some areas of uh, mild dysplasia in the cerebral hemisphere and the vermis. And on the sagittal images, you can appreciate that corpus callosum is thinned out. Um, the optic nerves are also possibly thinned out over there. Um, and then you have the hyperplasia of the brainstem. The pond is almost not, uh, the at least the ventral pontine belly is not visualized. And you can see that there is some vermis hyperplasia. Follow-up scan, a better images in 2015. Um, and now you can appreciate that again, the abnormalities are predominantly in the central regions. Basal ganglia lateral ventricles abnormal. And if you see over here, at least the fourth image, you can appreciate that there is some dysgyria and some polymicrogyria, pachygyria over there in the perisylvian regions. Uh, coming inferiorly again, you see that the cortex is thickened in the posterior perisylvian region over there. Um, and then if posterior, posteriorly, you have these abnormal foliation of the vermis. The, the brainstem here is abnormal again. Uh, typical of the fibonopathy um, spectrum disorders, you can see that there is asymmetry of the lower pons and the pontum is in medullary junction. And again, the medulla is abnormal. There is some degree of dysplasia in the cerebral hemispheres, predominantly in the inferior cerebral hemispheres over there. Um, again, clearer images demonstrating the similar imaging finding. Um, central uh, malformations of particle development, polymicrogyria, some degree of pachygyria. Again, basal ganglia abnormal, ventricles are abnormal, and we have these abnormalities of the brainstem and the cerebellum on both sides. And then, uh, as uh, this part, we don't have a diagnosis, but we're thinking of uh, tubulinopathy given the posterior posta findings and also the abnormalities in the supratentorial hemispheres. Uh, just to highlight uh, the abnormality of the brainstem, this is a paper from the, I think, Italian group, uh, the Aragoni et al. group, and you can appreciate that the uh, brainstem can be abnormal because the tubulins are responsible for the axonal guidance and they can have um, various abnormalities in terms of cross asymmetry, the pons can be asymmetrical, um, and they can also be um, abnormalities in the midbrain and also in the level of the medulla. These were the findings which they found uh, in the various genes. Uh, from this paper, there were 15 patients and um, you can see that uh, some have more prominent findings, whereas some such as the tub 2 b does not have clefting as demonstrated in tub A1 and tub 3 mutation. Uh, I would I don't know if we can uh, characterize the subtype, uh, the possibility of the gene, but tub 3 and tub 5 mutations were, are known to have milder malformations from the seminal paper published in 2014 over there. And this is another paper which demonstrates the various uh, malformations, uh, supratentral malformations and the various tubinopathy genes. So at this point, I'll open the, as if you don't have a generic diagnosis, I'll open the case for the panelists to comment upon for any additional inputs. Tube A1A can have a microcyst in the cerebellum, just like congenital muscular dystrophies, I think. Got it. Um, Sanjay, what is your experience on that? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Uh, now, I think the uh, the brainstem here is much more abnormal. So, at least yeah. I think it's a hindbrain malformation, really. I mean, that, that looks more more you know, hindbrain than supracentrally. I just wanted to like, um, say which was more. I don't thought the hindbrain was, oh. was, was more abnormal. Then look at that, that brainstem, and sagittal limits especially, very, very small, very thin. Um, and yeah. the cerebellum is very dysplastic. All those folia are yeah. really abnormally uh, oriented. Um, and yeah, the basal ganglia are abnormal too. So you think of the tubulopathies, yes, but in fact, I was actually thinking more hindbrain first, but you know, both are possible, I guess. Um, the corpus callosum looked dysmorphic too. I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Sachel. Um, yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, the only as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, that brainstem there. Very, very odd. 
sudden. And these malformations, uh, when there is a dysplastic brainstem, the te tectum usually will be very thick, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the, the, the length is, exactly, it's lengthened as well. It's almost like lengthened and fat on the AP dimension. Yeah. Um, you can draw a straight line from the midbrain down to the middle, and it's almost like a, it's almost, yeah, there's almost no curvature. Vertical. It's very yeah. vertical, yeah, exactly. Uh, and what about the cortex itself? Uh, I can't tell from the images here. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's so, the meta image, yeah. So here, I think it's mm. normal over there at that point. Exactly. Uh, right. Very on both also, sides, I think, other side as well, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 Right there. Yeah. I think the T1. Yeah, I that would make a tip yeah. so, Top five would, top five, I think, would fit with the amount of uh, uh, brainstem. Do you have the genetics? I, I'm sorry. I, I no, said no, it, no we don't have we don't yeah, okay. yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you for the inputs. Uh, the genetics is still awaited. And uh, uh, I'm actually speaking from Sai Deepak's link. I could not get the panelist link. That's why I'm Dr. Kavita Shivastam. Uh, the only thing is that uh, looking at the MRI, one would feel that the child would be very, you know, uh, having a lot of seizures, would be maybe profound to at least severe ID. But that way is quite well preserved. It does have spasticity, crouch gait, and uh, micro, uh, microcephaly is there, but more of ADHD and behavioral spectrum and maybe mild, uh, moderate uh, ID. So looking at the MRI, is uh, he's not having any drug refractory epilepsy as well as uh, not very severe uh, debilitating uh, neurological disability. So that's... Uh, any cranial no problem are these, Dr. Uh, not so. I no, don't think so. No. no. Okay. There is no frank okay. dysmorphism as well. Okay. He's just and a parent neither complex, does he have any Like parents. Yeah, a little bit fair. Yeah, as compared to the parents. That's all. Okay. I think Thank we're you. all agreeing that um, it is a likely to be not a yeah, eight disorder. Uh, so maybe so top five is the closest. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll get back with the genetics uh, once we get it done. I think uh, the whole next main clinical exam should cover the, all the tubing options. Yeah. I don't know how specific it can be, but top five and top three, is, uh, as Sanjay said, is, has more brainstem malformations and slightly milder variation of the supertentral brain. Sure, sure. Uh, that also goes with the uh, phenotype as well, right? Yeah. Sorry. I had some no, question no. for the panel. Like uh, very commonly, we do get these uh, uh, basal ganglia as well as uh, uh, dys uh, dysplasia as well as the uh, polymicrogyria which can be attributed to antenatal uh, infections like CMB. But uh, uh, these uh, congenital infections do not affect the brainstem, is it? So if you're getting brainstem and cerebellum, it is more likely to be genetic? Not cerebellum, you can see. In CMB, for example, you can see cerebellum, but very typically you don't see brainstem. Uh, if you do, it's usually like a older in generation type of thing. Uh, they affect mainly the cere cerebellar hemis sorry, cerebral hemispheres. Uh, and even the calcifications, you'll see almost exclusively a cerebral hemisphere. Um, the brainstem and hindbrain, uh, because it develops earlier, I don't think it's as affected. CMV especially will be supertentorial almost always. Uh, one of the ways you can differentiate, well, you can try and differentiate antenatal infection from uh, congenital malformations. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, I don't think the basal ganglia also are um, seen in CMVs. You might see it if you have polymacroagia, significant polymacroagia, yeah. then the basal okay. ganglia can be abnormal along with that. Okay, got it. All right, uh, then no further comments, we'll move on to our next case. Uh, Rupa, over to you. Uh, sir, is it okay if I share my own screen? Uh, I think it'd be easier if you do it from here. Uh -huh, because uh, I had uh, prepared in a specific order, that's why. Oh, you, can, you can read it out from your, from your presentation, that's fine. Yeah, sure. Just a minute. Uh, had a pedigree and all that in our slides, so I thought that would be interesting for the panelists and the other. Okay, 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 okay. Let me check. Rabu, can uh, can you make Rupa invite share the screen? 
Yeah, Rupa, try now. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, so I'm Dr. Rupa from uh, Medical Genetics Department, NIN. So here uh, we had an interesting case. Uh, they were uh, referred from a private obstetric unit, a third degree consanguineous couple with a child with a global developmental delay. So a diagnosis of this child was very important because uh, they had a, an ongoing third pregnancy at 17 week gestation. So as you can see the pedigree, the proband is shaded here and uh, they had terminated the second pregnancy and there was a third ongoing pregnancy at 13, 17 weeks gestation. So uh, as you can see, they are third degree consanguineous couple. Uh, that is, they are uh, married within first cousins. So the child was apparently normal till nine months after which the uh, parents started noticing the child had uh, jerky movements or seizure-like activity. And uh, there was history of stiffness of all four limbs since 10 months of age. And uh, there was no history of recurrent infections or vomiting, loose tools, or uh, there was no history of episodes of dull activity or loss of consciousness. So the child was uh, mostly having focal uh, seizure type, and uh, there was no history of regression of already attained milestones. Antenatal history, birth history was uneventful, and family history was unremarkable. And coming to developmental milestones uh, in the motor domain, neck control was achieved at five months, rollover at six months, uh, sitting, standing with support or without support was never attained. Uh, and in the language and social domain, social smile and recognition of mother was attained at three months, monosyllable at eight months, but uh, the child did not attain any meaningful words and uh, does not respond when called and uh, toilet indication was not attained, although the child was four and a half years old. And uh, developmental age was corresponding to six to eight months of age. So on examination, the child was thin built, moderately nourished. Uh, there was significant microcephaly with abnormal skull shape. It was tower like and uh, there was a bit of uh, bitemporal narrowing. Um, and the child had bushy eyebrows, long lashes, low set prominent ears, broad nose, thick lips, slender tapering fingers, oromandibular dyskinesia was seen, and with bilateral undescended testes. And coming to growth centiles, the head circumference was 44 centimeters, which was minus 4.3 standard deviations below the mean. And the white and uh, lens were also minus 3.5 standard deviation below the mean. So as you can see the clinical uh, picture on the lateral and frontal view. So on the lateral view, we can see that the uh, ears are somewhat low set and prominent. And uh, on frontal view, we can see the eyelashes are quite long and uh, the eyebrows are bushy with coarse hair. And uh, there is broad nose and thick lips. Uh, it's not fitting into any particular dysmorphic syndrome, but yeah, they are, uh, uh, the child is a little bit dysmorphic. And coming to central nervous system examination, the child was alert, but not reaching for orbit motor. Uh, the tone was increased on all four limbs. The dystonia was seen with abnormal hand posturing. Uh, the power, uh, coming to power, the upper and lower limb power was uh, 3 by 5, both proximal and distal group. The deep tender reflexes were exaggerated with the uh, 4 plus, and there was no ankle clonus and bilateral plantar reflex were extensor. Uh, and the findings were suggestive of spastic quadriparesis. There was no obvious cerebellar signs. Hearing was grossly normal. Visual tracking was preserved. And uh, the cardiovascular, respiratory, and GI system were normal. So coming to investigation part, uh, the child has been extensively evaluated both in uh, Rainbow Hospital and in TMS. So in TMS, in 2019, they had done TMS for amino acid and uh, cell carnitine level, which was normal. And uh, plasma lactate and serum homocysteine were within normal limit. And uh, in 2019, clinical exome sequencing was done, which identified a compound heterozygous variant in the SZT2 gene uh, related to infantile epile epileptic encephalopathy type 18. But on parental segregation, both these compound heterozygous variants were present in both of the parents. So this was di disregarded because uh, it is likely to be harmless uh, because both parents are having the mutation and they are not harboring any disease. And uh, EEG was suggestive of epileptic encephalopathy. MRI in 2019 was suggestive of benign enlargement of subarachnoid spaces. And MRI brain was repeated in 2020, which, was, uh, which will be discussed by uh, Dr. Nihal. And in 2022, whole exome sequencing was done, and uh, which identified three variants. Uh, two were uh, homozygous, and was uh, one was heterozygous. And uh, this uh, first uh, variation was kif one ag uh, which is related to Nutcalf syndrome. But uh, this variant was uh, been yes. Uh, Rupa, yeah. can I just stop you? Maybe I'll show the images first, and we can get back to the genes. Yeah, uh, yeah. I have the gene genetic reports on the slides. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, thanks. Uh, can you just stop sharing? Yeah. 
All right. Um, so thanks, Rupa, again. Um, and these yeah. are the MR, the latest MR images which we have. And you can appreciate that there is extensive uh, um, cerebral atrophy predominantly in the peripheral regions, the cortical regions, oh. and. Sorry, your slides. Yeah, are we can't see your slides. Now. You need to share your screen. Can you see yeah, this? Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. So yeah, we have the T2 axles over there, and you can appreciate there is extensive uh, cerebral atrophy, predominantly in the cortical regions over there, and uh, with the secondary uh, widening of the subarachnoid spaces, cellular fissures are uh, widened over there. Uh, white matter is abnormally hyper intense, um, extensively in the bilateral cerebral hemispheres. But what you can appreciate is the deep brain nuclei are relatively preserved in terms of the volume changes. I would also argue possibly slightly type T to hypo intense um, in comparison to the, um, the cortex over there. Posteriorly, if you come, the brainstem uh, appears to be normal. There no, there's no more volume uh, reduction. There is possibly some degree of cerebellar from polial prominence from cerebellar atrophy. And on the diffusion weighted sequences, there were no area of restricted diffusion uh, or acute changes in the supratentorial and the intratentorial brain. T1 weighted sequences, again, you can appreciate the extensive particle thinning with wide and subarachnoid spaces, relative sparing of the deep brain nuclei, possibly mildly hyperintense along the ventilateral aspect of the thalamus. But again, nothing uh, standing out in the posterior fossa other than some degree of cerebellar atrophy. So that images, you can appreciate that the corpus is diffusely thinned, some degree of thinning of the midbrain. The pons is, pons and belly is maintained. Again, some possibly some atrophy of the anterior vermis, but other than that, uh, the rest of the posterior fossa structures uh, were not as significantly affected as the supratentorial brain. The GRE sequences, the no evidence of hemorrhage or calcification. Um, and again, this is a slightly thin size sequence of the uh, skeletal sequence. Of, you can appreciate the diffuse thinning of the corpus callosum. The genes, uh, if we look at the imaging possibilities, we had cases of um, trapopathies which had similar imaging findings, uh, which demonstrated uh, extensive cerebral atrophy with relative sparing of the uh, central structures. They were slightly hypointense as published in this paper in the Brain Journal. Um, the other differential we thought of was possibly a mitochondrial disorder, mRNA and tRNA dis uh, degradation disorders, which can also have uh, these uh, supratentorial atrophic changes. NCL, but I don't think clinically it fits, um, can also have cerebral atrophy, but some degree of cerebral atrophy also is expected. Uh, Biotidinase clinically does not match, and uh, we have the possibility of any chronic stage or burnt out stage uh, process can present with similar supratentorial atrophy. Um, and these are the genetic reports. Rupa, if you can just uh, go through from this slide. Yeah, sure. Uh, so when we see the first uh, uh, report, whole exon sequencing report, uh, there's a variant on the KIF1A gene, so which is heterozygous variant associated with Nescap syndrome, which is autosomal dominant disease. But uh, this is of uncertain significance according to the lab. But uh, when we further uh, did some uh, uh, analysis, we found that the variant is of benign prediction. And uh, this variant, kif one a gene variant, was also found in the asymptomatic parents. So both parents are having the mutation, so it is unlikely to cause the disease in the child. And uh, coming to the second variant, call 6 a 3 gene, which is homozygous related to dystonia type 27, uh, related to uh, which is an autosomal recessive disease. Uh, this variant was also, according to uh, variant prediction software, it was benign and it was not matching the phenotype of the child. And uh, the CBS gene, anyway, it was not matching the phenotype of the child, uh, phenotype of the child uh, of the child altogether. So we think uh, this whole exome sequencing was inconclusive, and uh, we did a further parental testing with the parental whole exome sequencing analysis with the trio analysis. So in that, uh, in that too. We found that the uh, parents are carrier of this uh, call 6 a 3 gene. Uh, both were heterozygous carriers. Uh, but then it does not it does not uh, match the phenotype of the child and it is of benign prediction. So as of now, if, as of now, the child's uh, diagnosis, genotypic diagnosis is uh, uh, not established. And we have sent the sample for uh, whole genome sequencing. So report is awaited. So, so uh, Neha, yeah. may I add something here? Sure. I'm Pragya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, after we got your inputs on the MRI brain, we actually reanalyzed the whole exome data 
And specifically, we looked for variants in the TRAPC4 gene as also the other suggestions that you had given. But uh, on reanalysis, uh, after your inputs, we actually did not get any significant variants in any of these other genes either. So, um, so there's still a possibility that it could be one of these conditions and the variant could be something like a deep intronic variant, which is not covered in whole exome. Hence we are, and anyway, because the whole exome, including the trio whole exome analysis with the parental WAS has been inconclusive. We mm -hmm. are anyway planning to go ahead with whole genome sequencing for the child. But of course, uh, that would not help us for the present pregnancy because she's already having an ongoing pregnancy. And by the time the reports come in, it would probably be beyond 24 weeks and uh, it would be a little late to do the prenatal testing for this pregnancy. But uh, thank you so much for your inputs. But uh, unfortunately, the reanalysis uh, for these uh, for the data for these particular genes did not re really reveal any significant variants. No, maybe the maybe the panelists have put further suggestions. So yeah, I'll open the case for the panelists. And any other one? I think there was a the question of glutaric aciduria given the viral children fissures. Uh, microcephaly, I don't think they clinically fit. Is that right? Uh, and the basal ganglia also are relatively normal. So it did not clinically fit. And besides, yeah. metabolic screen also was not in favor yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'll open the case. Was... Uh, so yeah, so Nihaldi, I think the uh, striking feature on the imaging was the widened silver and fissure. I think I would start with that because the atrophy is there. And, and like you said, the cerebellum is, uh, is relatively spared. Um, and I know that uh, the, uh, the gene you mentioned, I think is a microtubule gene, um, the K1. I think that there is a disorder with that name. If it's aut autistic patients will, I think they have seen those, that, that particular gene in autistic patients, but haven't seen it in this particular um, scenario. Uh, but you definitely can have volume loss um, uh, in the uh, in that particular genetic variant. I don't know if it's uncertain significance or is that not been described enough. Uh, I have to go back and look at that one. Uh, yeah, that that thing you had a yeah the K yeah. KIF one A disorders. There's actually a paper yeah. by I think Ashok Panigrahi from uh, Pittsburgh as well. I can't remember the, okay. the date and the year, but uh, that would be one of the things. Is the the the, the um, a very unusually large sylvian fissures. That's and then you have the atrophy. Um, so I don't think the atrophy was uh, is like you know just global atrophy accounts for that sylvian yeah. fissure thing. Number one. Yeah. Number two is um, the uh, other things mentioned. Glutaric acid again doesn't doesn't even fit the imaging phenotype either. I think sylvian fissures are just one of those features, but other things like the basal ganglia are not don't, don't fit. It's actually normally spared. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, epileptic encephalopathy is are the seizures like significantly like are there lots of seizures or is that uh, or no seizures uh, or controlled? What's the seizure situation right now? Uh, no, the child was having focal seizures. Focal seizures mm -hmm. were still not controlled. Focal from which part of the brain? Uh, means the the upper limb, lower limb. EEG was suggestive of epileptic encephalopathy. That's it. Okay, so we'll generalize. Okay, okay. That kind of fits more with the pattern because if it's focal, then you can look for any focal abnormality and yeah. try to yeah. cure that. But um, yeah, if it's all over, probably not. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we've done the workup so far. I think the genetics would has not pointed to anything specific, but everything here, I think, is the workup and the differential has been discussed. So nothing else I think I can add here. Mm -hmm. Vijay? I think I completely agree. Uh, but the problem is uh, when the patient has got a clinical uh, dysmorphic facies with a small philtrum and abnormal nose, can we actually, I mean, in the uh, whole exome sequencing, whether uh, further gene testing any other than considering uh, these considerations, like for chromosome 4 anomalies, other anomalies, whether it can, can also produce a similar uh, facial phenotype as well as diffuse brain atrophy? So usually whole exome sequencing, uh, now softwares are able to pick up copy number variations on the chromosomes also. So we would have picked up uh, picked it up on whole exome. Okay. Yes, and the epileptic encephalopathy right. so, uh, gene patterns much harder, right? Sorry, the epileptic encephalopathy, uh, we still are finding about 500 genes and still counting. We find them every day. So that's the one I would be looking at. Yeah, it's a large sure. heterogeneous group, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your inputs. 
Thanks. Thanks. I, I just have a question. Like when we say that the EEG is showing epileptic encephalopathy, and, and on top of that, are there any other specific uh, uh, you know, descriptors, whether it is a multifocal with very frequent generalization, or is it like a CSWS pattern, or is it like a hip arrhythmia? Because even in that epileptic encephalopathy, you may get some more descriptors, which can maybe help you to pinpoint uh, you know, the particular genes as well. Oh, yeah, but uh, the EEG was done outside, so we just had just one point on the EEG comment, so we did not have uh, the original EEG report. Okay, no, no, I'm asking Prajna this question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe any, we any can... specific uh, descriptors in the EEG, because epileptic encephalopathy is a very, not just a very non-descriptor term. So in that, if we have any particular descriptors, does it correlate with the particular variants, uh, you know, particular mutations? For some of them, but uh, um, nothing that I'm, I'm able to recall offhand. But yes, you're right. For some of the EG patterns, there are some specific uh, genetic associations uh, mentioned. Uh, yeah, but as Rupa said, for this particular child, there was we did not really have the complete report. And besides, uh, I don't think anything particular is mentioned other than an abnormal EG record. So. Yeah, in this particular child, uh, the EG was not really uh, in favor of anything in particular other than a generalized epilepsy kind of a picture. But yeah, you're right. Uh, there are some associations with uh, specific EG patterns and some genetic associations. Though offhand, uh, I really cannot uh, okay. tell you the exact ones. Yeah, yeah. The one I can remember yeah, is like in sodium one, channel uh, opaque, we say that okay, PPR may be there, right. uh, there may be excessive delta and so on. So that's why I'm asking. Okay. If the, yeah. We have more description of the EEG apart from what, uh, I mean, the baseline is there as a encephalopathic record. Maybe it can help us to pinpoint the variance further. Right. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, yeah Sanjay, you're saying something? Sorry. Um, so let's say Alpert syndrome or POLG1, mm, uh, yeah. we have mm. the uh, specific EEG pattern where we diagnose a case straight off the EEG to genetics. Yeah. Uh, Epilepsy just came in. I was looking at the MRI. He comes in, look at the EEG and says, this is RADS, this is POLG1 and walks away. That was very impressive, I thought. Um, so that's why I think that having the EEG as a, another phenotype is very important too. Thanks. Thanks for that information. I really think yeah. that EEG is the most uh, underrated uh, and underutilized uh, tool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Kirti, over to you. Uh, yes. So, uh, this case, uh, seven months boy uh, was born of third degree consanguinity. Um, so, this family actually had two abortions previously because both were ectopic pregnancies and both sides, the tubes had to be, uh, you know, a tubectomy had to be done. So, they had no option but to go for an IVF conception for this third child. And uh, he was born of 2.7 kg cried immediately at birth. There were no immediate uh, significant perinatal issues. However, at four months of age, was noticed to have motor developmental delay. Until seven months, he could not hold his neck. There was no rollover. There was no approach. There was no history of any spasms or seizures, but had significant feeding issues. Um, on examination, he had some dysmorphism, microcephaly with head size of 37 centimeter. Uh, failure to thrive, his weight for, was just uh, 5.6 kgs at seven months of age, and some dysmorphism like bitemporal hollow, hollowing, long philtrum, thin lips, uh, but vision was good, uh, fixing and tracking. And uh, on neurological examination, had more of generalized pasticity, both truncal and appendicular, and there was a lot of dyskinesia, oromandibular as well as appendicular dyskinesia. Um, so here we were thinking something about uh, structural metabolic genetic. These were the causes that were thought and uh, hence uh, evaluated. Maybe we can see the yeah. images. Yeah. All right, companion case uh, to the one before that. Again, you can appreciate almost similar imaging picture of the supratentorial brain, uh, extensive particle atrophy. Again, widened the sylvan fissures over there. Uh, the deep brain nuclei slightly uh, preserved. Uh, preserved in terms of volume changes. Um, cerebellum and brainstem, again, um, in comparison to the supratentorial vein, um, the, the volume appears to be normal. 
Kirti, at what age was the scan done? Any idea? Uh, this was at five months of age. Five months. Okay. Let's see the corpus callosum. I think there's they some hypoplasia of the septum pilostomo there, but all right. So the corpus callosum is again is hypogenetic. You can see that it's uh, similarly thinned out. And again, T1-weighted sequences, um, predominant particle atrophy, Biden's in fissures, uh, no hemocytrin or calcification on the parenchyma. And on the kernel sequences, you can appreciate the gradient of the supratentorial predominant uh, atrophy in comparison to the cerebellum. Um, and then, Kirti, I think the child was evaluated. Uh, yes. TMS. Yeah. Yes. So because of those widened sylvian fissures, uh, mm -hmm basically evaluated for organic acidemia, glutaric acidemia, but uh, TMS mm -hmm. and GCMS were non-contributory. Lactate ammonia yeah. was normal. And uh, EEG was done, which was just showing some uh, slowing of the background. There were no epileptic on discharges. Uh, and then uh, the whole exome was sent. Okay. And yeah, it had actually identified a pathogen. This was a pathogenic mutation, a mm -hmm. homozygous mutation in uh, TRAPC4. And this is again uh, a companion ET. You have seen this case, uh, I think this was last from last year. And you have again similar imaging phenotype, uh, spared central structures. Uh, this child also had spasms and some, big, some alopecia. And again, you had a similar gene which was found out uh, on whole exome sequencing. So now I'll open the case uh, to the panelists. Do they have any additional comments and any others in the chat? I think this one uh, uh, more like a trapopathy, which uh, mm -hmm. has yeah. actually diagnosed previously. But uh, I have one question for the clinician. The previous child had a short filter, and this has got a long filter. Has it got anything, or is it just a dysmorphic, general dysmorphic features? So, anything to do with the specific mutations you look for? Actually, with? in trap, in trap C4, long filter is described. So, as a, as a part of this, I was telling about the chromosome four abnormalities. A short filtrum with a diffuse cortical volume loss is uh, described in uh, uh, yes. for uh, microarray abnormalities. So whether these subtle clinical features will uh, show us uh, more, I mean, throw light to that uh, specific mutations rather than brain imaging, which is very, very non-specific. I think it's a combination, isn't it? So this is why I think, well, this is why AI and machine learning comes in because these disparate things uh, come together and this the actually original description of trap C4, as we just said, was the long filter was actually described in that initial collection. And it's the face is the is the harbinger to the mind or whatever they say. I think the face reflects the mind. That thing, the problem is we don't put them together all the time unless you get in a conference like this and like talk together. But in fact, AI can do this now. You look at clinical notes, you put them together. It comes up with a series of uh, you know, choices. And it's in fact maybe cheaper than doing genetics in some places. Some places is you know it depends. Uh, but the other thing is on myelination on this case. If you go back to the imaging, you said five months. I don't think the anterior limb actually has any myelination in there. I think the myelination is a bit delayed on the on the first scan you showed, on the second one too. Um, that's another feature that I would also bring up here. Um, and uh, did this get seizures? I missed the seizures portion again. No seizures. No. No seizures, okay, because they, they can have uh, epilepsy too. Um, and the, um, yeah, go, go back one more to, to, to the uh, image on the, uh, the skill, uh, Nihal. But the anterior limb had no myelination yeah. and the cup's globe is very, very small. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think my screen has frozen. It's um, stuck, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, so you see, posterior limb is fully myelinated, but the anterior mm. limb not so much. And the atrophy is also like frontal temporal predominant. Um, mm. with the salient yeah. fissures being wide, the post occipital and parietal lobes are relatively spared. Um, yeah, trap the trapopathy would be a good, good thought here. Um, so Ramit has a comment of UBTF. Uh, I've not seen an imaging pattern for that gene, but yeah, he says neuroregeneration brain atrophy is a differential for hypopathy. UBTF. Yeah. I think I have a case somewhere. I'll try and dig it up if I can. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kitty. Thanks, Sanjay. Thanks, Dr. Bujai.
Deepak again over to you. Yes, sir. Uh, this is an eight and a half year old boy, non non consanguineous marriage, normal perinatal history with mild motor delay. He had six to seven episodes of fever provoked GTCS in sleep between one and a half to three years of age. EEG done at that time was normal, and he is treated as febrile seizures at that time outside. And at six years of age, he had unprovoked GTCS with uprolling of eyeballs, uh, followed by uh, that lasted for twenty minutes, followed by postictal drowsiness in sleep again. At that time, EEG showed background asymmetry, poor alpha activity over the left. And also showed uh, right-sided centrotemporal spike wave discharges, which were exaggerated in sleep, multifocal, without secondary generalization. So suggestive of Rolandic epilepsy. Um, we have started mm -hmm. on levetiracetam, and basic all the blood investigations, thyroid, calcium, and everything were normal. And his seizures were well controlled. Uh, two scans were done. One was done at, at the time at six years of age. First one, MRI. No, no antenatal. Uh... No antenatal abnormalities, no, no, nothing in uh, the no pregnancy. No, no antenatal issues. Sir. Okay, okay. All right. So I have the T2 axials on top of there, and uh, you can appreciate in the these uh, abnormality in the left cerebral hemispheres, some degree of abnormal uh, sulcation, dilation patterns, some hysteria over there. But if it comes lower down, you can appreciate that there is a uh, uh, curvilinear transplantal type of uh, gray matter heterotopia. Uh, over here, and especially on the second, third, and fourth images, you can see it goes down up to the parietal lobes, uh, up, up to the ependymal margins. So there is some degree of particle, I mean, dramatic heterotopia, and some degree of uh, abnormal variation, some dischargeic appearance in the left parietal lobe. Uh, inferiorly, again, uh, going down to the occipital region, you can appreciate the abnormal um, mal the malformed cortex and the dramatic heterotopia. Um, posteriorly, there's some uh, abnormal foliation of the vermin. And also, again, the mild asymmetry of the, uh, the peduncles, again, um, the left is slightly smaller than the right. Um, let's see, and I cannot appreciate any other stru structural malformations uh, on the contralateral side. Um, atrophy, I may possibly, the frontal lobes are slightly, the circle spaces are, the retina spaces are slightly widened. Uh, basal ganglia appear normal. Um, yeah, so predominant changes of uh, these stray matter heterotopia in the left, Parietal temporal and occipital lobes. Uh, thin cut T1 coronal sequences, again, you can appreciate uh, the degree of heterotopia going from the ependymal margins up to the cortex. So, a form of curvilinear transmetal type of um, gray matter heterotopia is the predominant finding with some abnormal gyration associated with it. The corpus callosum, you can see that it is uh, hypogenetic on the posterior aspect. Um, yeah, the brainstem in terms of volume, possibly the midbrain is slightly uh, reduced in caliber. Uh, again, the pontine with mesencephalic and medial junction is not clearly defined. So there's possibly some degree of volume loss over there. Uh, on the established sequences, uh, no calcification hemorrhage, but there is an abnormal or slightly prominent uh, transparable or transcortical vein going on there around the region of the gray uh, matter heterotopia. Nihal, can you go back to the cerebellum for a second? On the first scan, it didn't look like dysplastic on the left cerebellum yeah, hemisphere. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. The, the left one is okay. okay. Sorry, sorry, again, my screen has frozen. If you unshare and share, it probably yeah, will freeze itself. Yeah. yeah. So uh, here, actually, we wanted to ask whether there is any abnormality on the right side as well. The EEG is showing predominantly right-sided centrotemporal discharges. Uh, which, yeah, uh, look at the right frontal like, lobe. I was going to say that when the images come back. So the images had to come back, but I thought the right side is also not completely normal. If you look up, you mm -hmm. pull up the images and I'll show you where. Look at the right frontal lobe. Uh, superior frontal gyrus almost. I think there's some thickening there, and especially on the coronal images in the second slide. I can see in front of my screen. But when you pull up them, I can show you that. It's abnormal actually, although there's lots of little areas abnormal on both sides, but I think the left is clearly more abnormal than the right. The right's not normal. And the cup is closed on being that sharp 
it, it kind of worries you that there's more happening than you're actually seeing. But uh, and exactly which uh, ele electrode is uh, abnormal in the EG? Centrotemporal right side, sir, showing yeah, uh, okay. spike and slope. Okay, and that uh, that would fit. So sometimes it's not the EG most abnormal areas like which fire. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, that's the other like thing is the EG eclipsing. is... Yeah. Right. Yeah. So okay. Mark EG sleep three, exaggeration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you look on the uh, third... Uh, if you see if you can draw on this thing. Sorry, Nihal, I'm going to draw on the screen, okay? No, that's fine, uh, yeah. Don't don't ban me for doing this. <laughs> uh, go to the next next slide, please. Go to the next uh, the the coronal images on the T ones that you had. I think it's this area, but uh, let's look on the coronal images. They're probably better seen. Uh, you still stuck? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll probably log out and log in if that's uh, okay. I'll just try it from a uh, different system. Okay. Yeah, just bear with me. I'll be back in. Sorry about that. So this child is otherwise well preserved and does not have very refractory seizures. In fact, seizure free for the last three years. And the current EG is almost the same. Uh, the first one was normal. The current EG is showing just a almost similar to a Bex kind of child. And mm -hmm. if he has both bilateral dysplasia, so because we were wondering whether we can come off the drugs. So now that he does has a, have an explanation for the right set discharges as well, probably we'll have to continue. Yeah, sometimes when you have a, a, like an abnormal thing like this, especially on the motor area, you see that the, the mapping happens and the seizures are not as bad as the imaging looks. And that's sort of surprising to me always that the least abnormal areas are the most seizure inducing sometimes i have no idea why but um we have to look for those small areas which are which are probably are causing more problems and even these cases we have surgical options in some of these kids uh we do stereo ag and and uh, resection even if it looks like this that's another option if you have refractory seizures obviously not for this also oh, motor function okay this is around the central sulcus is motor function normal on that side on the right side yeah, motor function is okay and uh even the seizures are also not refractory. Okay. Seizures are well controlled for the last three years. Yeah. So that's quite interesting to know that uh, almost like uh, less uh, abnormal looking areas may be more epileptogenic. Yeah, especially when you have the infarcts, for example, is a very good example where you have a large area of infarction, but the area which fires in the stereo EG or on like uh, when you resect and see the seizure freedom is the areas which look like they are far away from that and so the edges of the you know the the areas which have like half half destroyed brain those seem to fire the most so here um let me click on the images yet sorry anyhow we're trying to uh, pressurize you here yeah i think you're there look at here and he, oh, so just went back, go back, go back and there. Uh, I would look at those areas in the axial, just scroll, scroll through them. They are not very, and even here, look at this cortex here. Doesn't look very normal. I can't scroll through the images, obviously, but uh, those were the areas I would be looking at. Uh, that's why the EEG is very important when you have something like this. I usually have a second look at that same thing. Um, you know, uh, those areas specifically in relation to the EEG. I'll also review the scan a second or third time with the EEG next to me. And have somebody obviously to read the EEG with me. Um, uh, but yeah, it's always important to look at the other side. I say I, I get paid to look at the other side, not the abnormal side, the other side, which is, looks normal. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you so much.
Yeah, sorry, Sanjay, I missed the discussion. Yeah, I can't hear you. Oh, there no? you are. Yes, you're speaking. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. So I was, wasn't, no, wasn't so sure. The, the question was, oh, sorry, I just wanted to know if uh, uh, the genetic cause is still a possibility or is it just a vascular disruption which has caused these changes? Um, I would think you should do genetic testing anyway. Okay. You can never tell this overlap between what's vascular and what's not, especially you have bilateral abnormalities and you have EG abnormalities on the other side too. Uh, mm. I mean, it could be most likely is vascular. I mean, looking at the, the pattern here and the corpus callosum looking like that, yeah. something has happened uh, and that posterior region. But then if you have a frontal dysplasia too, there's no harm in doing a, um, you know, an epilepsy gene panel uh, okay. or a, a West. Got it. Yeah, I think we'll skip this part and we'll move on to the next case. Uh, Hina, if you're there. Yes, I am here. Yeah. This is a 13 month old uh, boy. He's a first child of non consanguineous marriage. Uh, there was no significant antenatal or birth history. And he came to us with the uh, chief complaints of uh, delay in attaining milestones, uh, motor more than cognitive and also had three episodes of unprovoked seizures. All three were uh, GTCS. On examination, his head circumference was 46 centimeters, which was just below the 50th percentile. And he had a severe head lag along with hypotonia, decreased reflex and de decreased reflexes. Bilateral, uh, uh, bilateral eyes, uh, there was limited uh, abduction. And uh, even though the uh, vision and hearing was preserved. So uh, he can sit with, without support when made to, he has partial weight bearing, social smile and babbling is present. Um, so uh, relatively preserved. And uh, I mean, the, even though he's having a developmental delay, it is motor, which is more uh, uh, predominant uh, rather than the cognitive. Uh, mother has a history of spontaneous abortion at two months and there is no other significant family history. Uh, sir, can we move on to them? Yeah, so we have the images, uh, I think done recently and you can appreciate- yes, yeah, you can appreciate extensive white matter abnormality over there uh, involving the bilateral cerebral hemispheres. Uh, also, there's malformation. Um, so there's possibly some degree of polymicrogyria, some abnormal gyration in the frontal temporal regions. And the posterior hemispheres demonstrate these pachygyric appearance or listen um, along the bilateral parietal and occipital lobes. Uh, in terms of the white matter abnormalities, the corpus callosum was relatively spared. The internal capsules were also relatively spared. Uh, basal ganglia and thalamus appeared normal. Mm. And coming down posteriorly, again, you can see that there's hand brain malformation. Um, this will be better appreciated on the sagittal images, but here you can see that the brainstem is abnormal. And there are uh, multiple tiny microcysts in the uh, subcortical cortical regions in the bilateral cerebral hemispheres. Uh, so these were the main findings which are appreciated on these scans. And then on the sagittal images, you can appreciate that there is a dysplastic corpus callosum, there's pontocerebellar hyperplasia, or there's abnormal severely thinned out or hyperplastic pons, brainstem is also hyperplastic, vermis in general is again hypoplastic and also dysplastic. And the coronal sequences, again, you can appreciate the white matter abnormalities, uh, extensive confluent abnormalities, uh, there's degree of uh, particle malformation, uh, more along the aspects of polygaria, polymicrogaria in the frontal temporal lobes. And along the posterior aspect, you have these pachygaric pa pa or lysencephalic type pattern on the bilateral occipital regions and the posterior parietal regions. Again, similar findings on the T1V sequences. Uh, the white matter changes uh, demonstrate some degree of refraction or hypo intensities, um, suggesting of some degree of dysmyelination and demyelination, uh, not a hypomyelinating disorder, and with associated cortical malformations. And you can ap appreciate the cerebral assist um, in the cortical subcortical regions, um, especially in the inferior cerebellar hemispheres. And no calcification or hemocytrin um, on the SWA sequences. A spectroscopy, uh, I could not appreciate any uh, significance. The NA peak was commented to be slightly elevated. Um, the NA to choline ratio is ar around 1.8, I think, and the NA to creatine is around 1.7. And this was at that time uh, diagnosed to be a pathognomic or pathogenic, and um, I think was commented to be having Canavan's disease. Uh, I think the malformation was uh, not commented upon. Uh, then the possibility of a um, congenital muscular dystrophy was raised. Um, and if you just look at the cysts, focus on the cysts of the, of the cerebellum, 
you have these differentials which can present with cerebellar dysplasia and cerebellar cysts. Uh, muscular dystrophies uh, typically are commonly have these abnormalities, Proity Bolthaus syndrome, the ADGRG1 mutations, and the Col3A1 mutations commonly have cerebellar dysplasias and sub, uh, sub, subcortical cortical cysts. So if that's an imaging pattern, you need to uh, look at these differentials. Uh, then uh, thinking of congenital muscular dystrophies, um, Ina, if you can help me out, if um, the creatine kinase was elevated, um, and if there are any other findings which are uh, matching with this uh, algorithm here. Uh, yes, sir. So the CPK came elevated. It came back as 1418, 1400 around. Okay. So at present, we are thinking it is probably LAMA2, but does LAMA2 also have that uh, severe amount of cortical malformations and uh, cerebral mm -hmm. dysplasia? And uh, this, uh, that was a question. Okay, so these are the, um, from literature, you have these extensive white matter abnormalities, for instance, LAMA2 mutations. Ponto cerebellar hypoplasia, you have cerebellar dysplasia, subcortical cysts, and these posterior uh, or occipital uh, pachygyriac appearance uh, can be seen in LAMA2 mutations. And they are known to have uh, sparing of the corpus callosum and the internal capsules or the dense tracts is what they have mentioned in literature. The other dystrophies are the alpha dystrophic uh, which can also present with uh, almost similar imaging pattern. The brainstem is usually more kinked or there's some degree of uh, dysplasia in the brainstem, uh, which is actually not seen in our case, but not necessary uh, always. Um, yeah, these are the different spectrum of the alpha dystrophic ethnopathies can have similar imaging pattern. So we're looking at, I think, uh, congenital muscular dystrophies, uh, the phenotyping, I'll uh, probably leave it to the panelists if they want to comment upon. Was the eye normal? The, or was the, uh, I couldn't see the uh, globes on this. Oh yeah, I can yes, see. Yes, eyes were normal, side. except for uh, limitation of uh, abduction on both sides. Vision is also- Brainstem there. Yeah, I mean, congenital muscular dystrophy is, uh, is a very good thought. I think that NA peak there, uh, mm -hmm. what, if we go back to the MRS, uh, where is that voxel uh, process from? Is that, that that whole thing is one voxel? Is that what that is? Yeah, it's the at the, uh, I think it's in the cortex. Basal ganglia or something, or cortex or basal ganglia. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is on the higher self, for 13 month old, this is 13 months, I presume, it's yeah. a, from yeah. the age. Yes, 13 and, months. That is a little on the higher side, but uh, it's not so super high. It's not like the it, like a canavans type of thing. And also the imaging, the phenotype does not fit that either. Uh, but in the MRI itself, the diffusion I suspect was increased, like in a facilitated diffusion. Uh, when you have canavans, you'll, yeah. early on you'll see decreased diffusion in many cases. Not everyone, every case, but um, that NA peak I would not regard as pathognomonic. It is higher, and I would mention that, and you can see it as high in other conditions too, but uh, in canavans, you'll actually see everything else is depressed and the KNA is super high. Um, and uh, I can't think of like a way to narrow it down any further because you ha don't have any ocular features. The brainstem is very abnormal and that might fit your uh, the eye ocular features. Yeah, that's a very small pons. Uh, and uh, the cortical abnormalities, I have seen these in, like uh, as you showed the Part of the abnormalities are seen in uh, congenital muscle dystrophies, the myrosin deficient uh, ones, but um, I can't think of a way, another way to narrow it any further. Uh, yeah, Lama 2 would be a good thought, but. Yeah. If this is Mass Barker, I think somebody is asking this. If you look at the, 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 uh, white, the uh, internal capsules, for example, there's myelination there um, that probably wouldn't. I've thought about that. I was actually thinking more, that's why I thought head size was thinking of the uh, leukodystrophies because it's such a very abnormal looking white matter. And you see this in medicine deficient uh, you know, CMD, but you don't, don't see this. You can see it also in leukodystrophies too by itself, but not really to Pelizabeth Barker. That's usually a hypomyelination throughout and you won't see, you'll see internal capsules usually. And the NA can be high. That's an important thing is the MRS. Yes, the NA can be high in Pelizabeth Barker uh, because the choline actually is lower. I think there's a question of GPR 56. I think they're more of a cobblestone malformation. Um... Correct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we're discussing that we call, it's cobblestone, polymeric gyre, a bit of both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's both and uh, either side. It's the outer part and the inner part, both have normal. And you had that case there that, that that's more like a typical GPR 56 case on your on one of your slides. I think you had an image. Yeah. Uh, that's my, uh, yeah, that, that, uh, that one there, exactly. And the cerebellum usually has more like a little all macrogyric, little, little bit studded with little stones rather than cysts. Um, that's GPR 56 for me. Yeah, got it. I have.
had just one question that this amount of diffuse white matter involvement can can it be seen in any other CMDs other than myrosin deficient uh, muscular dystrophy? Here you have um, cases uh, white matter changes. So, uh, so, so that means that alpha dystroglycopathies can also have that severe amount of uh, severe involvement of uh, white matter. Yeah, so these are alpha dystroglycopathies. So, yeah, they can. Yeah. Okay. But these will have the ocular abnormalities yeah, ocular uh, in most of these cases. And, and the cortex is, as you can see, yeah. the Fukuyama is one shown there. Uh, that the white matter is abnormal in all these cases. When you have very abnormal bright white matter throughout, you think of this, and if you have a large head, think of megalencephalic look encephalopathy. Those are the two I remember for like very white sheet like uh, white matter abnormality. The corpus callosum is quite thick in uh, uh, llama too as well. I don't, don't think it was thickish on this one. It wasn't super thick, but that uh, T1 there looks a little, little fat. But. Yeah. So I think, you know, you're just, just wanted to make a comment. This is Dr. Prina. I think uh, Dr. Kirti and myself, we share a case from Vizag, uh, who has LAMA-2 with variant of unknown significance, mm -hmm. uh, with very similar MRI pictures, but his only presentation is with focal seizures with retained awareness. His mobility is quite good. And um, his uh, uh, the others are just behavioral abnormalities, could be related to the underlying uh, white matter abnormalities, or even to the ongoing seizures and seizure medication. So he has some hyperactivity and other things. So maybe the presentation can be quite variable. Right. All right, thanks Dr. Prima. All right, we'll move on to our next case if there are no other comments. So Hina, please get back to us if you have a genetic diagnosis. Sure, sir, I'll tell you. Yeah. Dr. Prima, over to you. Okay, so uh, this was a very interesting case of a four-month-old baby with uh, previously normal birth and antenatal history uh, who presented with uh, typical features of meningitis. The child had a febrile illness for about two days and then had irritable and shrill cry, uh, did not want to be handled at all, reflexes were brisk, and uh, she was definitely showing signs of raised uh, intracranial pressure. The only thing that didn't go in favor of... Uh, um, upper motor neuron was uh, the lower limb A reflexia. So her deep tendon reflexes uh, in the lower limbs were absent both, both at the knee and the ankle. And she was presenting with features of spinal cord involvement. She had a neurogenic bladder as well as constipation. Uh, so for such a young child, uh, we went with the common uh, things first. So we thought uh, probably it is related to one of the pyogenic infections, most probably pneumococcal. Um, she had a high CRP of 380 and CSF analysis showed very high counts uh, with very high proteins. However, the CSF culture was sterile and she did not respond to the conventional antibiotics, uh, you know, that we give for uh, pneumococcal and influenza meningitis. Uh, so then we did a scan. Um, yeah. Which, yes. Yeah. yeah, so we have the scan and uh, you can appreciate that there is a... Um, in degree of ventricle or there the lateral ventricles are dilated, the third ventricle is dilated. Um, and then it, nothing on the diffusion uh, standing out. No, I don't see any um, diffusion change in the cisterns or circle spaces. Uh, but I think the extent of the ventricle can be appreciated on the sagittal images. So you can appreciate that there is a uh, yeah, lateral ventricle dilatation, third ventricle dilatation. Um, the GRE sequences did not demonstrate anything uh, in terms of calcification or hemorrhage. All right, so here we have the post contrast and you can see that there is diffuse ventriculitis uh, involving all the ventricles. And you can also appreciate leptobedingeal enhancement um, predominantly in the cisternal spaces um, along the brainstem. You can see that the dorsal aspect of the brainstem and the ventral aspect of the uh, worm is, demonstrates these areas of leptobedingeal enhancement. But then the spine was screened and the spine uh, demonstrated these are the non-contrast T2 sagittal sequences. I don't have an axial sequence. Uh, on the, you can appreciate that there is a long segment T2 hyperintensity in the intermediary region of the spinal cord. And on contrast, uh, there is, I don't have, again, the axles would have been possibly better, but you can see that there is a 
diffuse enhancement along the cervical thoracic and the lumbar cord. So this finding was uh, slightly um, uh, of concern and atypical for a bacterial typical bacterial infection. And then I think um, given that a possible bacterial infection was considered, I think we went ahead with a ESF-PCR. Is that right, uh, Dr. Prerna? Yeah, yeah. So we went for the BioFire panel and that showed us positive result. Um, um, yeah. yeah, so the CSF-PCR was positive for Listeria. I don't think we were expecting it uh, in a child with no pre-existing pre uh, history of recurrent infections or recurrent admissions. Um, so initially we uh, went in and did the external ventricular drainage um, until the protein counts came down and then we went for a VP shunt. Um, so this was a, a sort of a dicey situation to give the steroids because her septic markers were quite high. But because of the cord involvement, we went ahead and we gave. Uh, her uh, immunodeficiency workup, basic immunodeficiency workup was normal. So... Um, so then based on that, I just checked uh, any cases which have similar imaging findings. I think the supratentorial findings can be seen um, commonly in listeria. They usually have ventriculitis. Uh, some degree of microabscesses can be seen. Uh, leptomeningeal enhancement can be seen. Commonly also and known to have necrotizing abscesses. But then um, the typical features I've mentioned again over here, uh, there's diffuse involvement of the deep brain nuclei, the leptomeninges, meninges. Also, cranial nerve involvement can be seen, and this was a review of literature of all, almost all the listeria cases. And if you see the spinal cord over there, there are only four cases of spinal cord involvement. I could not, uh, and they were primarily rhombencephalitis related uh, changes where the uh, upper cervical cord was involved. Um, but such an extensive cord involvement, I think uh, I could not find in literature. So I'll open the case uh, for the panelists if they have similar experience. If there's an alternate possibility, or is this just all listeria causing these uh, spinal cord changes and the, the supratentorial and infratentorial changes? I think when I went through uh, literature also, mm -hmm. there's only one uh, reported case of very similar uh, history. Um, uh, the, there's just one case report of a 13-month-old baby. Most of the others are uh, mostly adults, and um, some of them are immunocompromised or have coexisting renal conditions and are under immunosuppression. So uh, to see this in an immunocompetent child, um, I don't know, I think that was the main question. Is this something that is unique uh, to listeria uh, infection, or should we explore further for this? But you also say there's good response to the typical uh, listeria. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So she yeah. responded brilliantly to ampicillin and vancomycin. And after we put the VP shunt in, she's almost like a normal child. She does have some amount of hypotonia, which is expected uh, with the amount of infection that she had. But she's doing well on rehabilitation. Okay. All right. You say one thing. I'm not a very... My infection is not my strong suit because I don't see listeria very often. I've seen like maybe three cases in my own entire life, which is not really common. But I look at the spinal cord. I think there's maybe some area of hypointensity on one of those, the thoracic region, almost like a hemorrhagic area there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't, don't think you have axils, but no, I, yeah, I exactly. It's on all three sequences. Is, yeah. It's all your the next, the next two panel, next two uh, images also have the similar area there. And hemorrhagic transformation can be seen in adult patients. I don't, like I said, I haven't seen too many pediatric, I've seen neonatal listeria, but not pediatric listeria. So it's, it is unusual. Um, but uh, you can see long segment uh, myelitis. Uh, remember many years ago in England, there was a kid with, there was an old lady with you know, myelitis uh, along with rhombencephalitis, which looked not this long. This is like almost the entire cord there. This is more like cervical cord. Uh, we never reported it. Uh, but I think uh, it would be unusual, and I would uh, definitely think about reporting this one. Yeah. Uh, I don't, don't think the spinal cord is anything different. I think it's yes, probably uh, the yeah, same yeah. thing. It's just uh, you had three days between that. The ventricles are increased in size. You have such severe leptomeningeal enhancement and ventriculitis, yeah. and it's not you know un unheard of to have that. And the hemorrhagic transformation that centrally, that if it does hemorrhagic transformation, that lends more credence to this being listeria than a sort of a secondary process. Dr. Vijay, any experience with listeria? Uh, I have patients with uh, post-rhombencephalitis mm -hmm. and with uh, this much of extensive uh, meningoencephalitic and ventriculitic process, I have never seen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also unusual for listeria to be an immunocompetent. They usually 
as dr prerna has mentioned immunodeficiency and this is a four month old usually uh, listeria yeah, is classically so, described uh, in newborn especially yeah, preterm yeah. uh, so <laughs> a little bit odd actually uh, how does it get transmitted uh, in general by is it by soil or food water i think uh, yeah so food contamination but this child is on breast milk so okay hmm. so this is commu community acquired listeria and uh, i think it's a very scary scenario if this is happening in community i guess all right yeah as sanjay has mentioned probably i think uh, we need to write it up because such a presentation is not typically seen and maybe a follow up scan scan if see if there's resolution of these changes the clinical response and the imaging response correlates or not yeah so we said this cheese and milk are the typical ones here mm -hmm. as well in england especially it used to be cheese and milk in the us i have not seen other than neonates are not seen listeria for a long time um, and i would say if you're going to publish this thing try to collect and this is from academic set point try to see if you can find two or three other cases which are typically when add them together and make it a case series presenting a case report is much harder than actually presenting a series of cases and showing pediatric listeria as a case and then showing this one thing as part of that sure sir um, but i think it's very difficult uh, for listeria to come by it's uh... yeah i mean you can put the neonatal ones along with it and show this is the typical one and here's a typical one or you can show one case and show the companion cases with that that's more publishable right now people don't take case reports anymore but case yes, series sir. definitely <laughs> Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Yeah, maybe Doctor Vijay can share his cases if he's not published yet. <laughs> we have only adult cases. We don't have a, a child with uh, rumbles like this. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks. I think this is our second last case. Um, Prithuja, if you're there. Yes. <clears throat> uh, this is a two years eight months old child born to non consanguineous marriage. Had one episode of seizure at five months of age. So the seizure started initially in the form of myoclonic jerks, and gradually it progressed to be generalized tonic-clonic seizures. And in past two years, eight months, he had to uh, sorry two years, three months, he had total of two episodes of status epilepticus. And the last episode of status epilepticus was three weeks back, where he was ventilated for around seven days. The investigations done at that time were all normal, including the CSF analysis. After the child was extubated from the ventilator, he developed dystonic posturing and arcing of the back. He was totally in uh, totally uh, arcing, which was persistent till he was admitted in our hospital. This was the main complaint for which they had come here. On examination, child had normal cephaly with good tracking was there, generalized hypotonia, dystonic posturing left upper and lower limb more dystonic than the right with arching of the back. So just to confirm, this last seizure was three weeks back. Last seizure was three weeks back. Okay, All right. And yeah, so here are the um, imaging findings. And um, I think seven days into the um, dystonic posturing, is that right, Prithuja? Uh, now it's almost three weeks. Okay, so all right. So in the diffusion, you can appreciate confluent abnormalities predominantly in the subcortical uh, white matter, frontoparietal regions um, coming more inferiorly. You can see the perisylvan regions also demonstrate these uh, cytotoxic edematous changes. The anterior basal ganglia um, are also demonstrating some areas of restricted diffusion. The bilateral thalami over there, the temporal lobes, the occipital lobes, uh, and the brainstem and the cerebellar structures do not have any changes of uh, restricted diffusion or cytotoxic edema. You can appreciate the corresponding confluent abnormalities of the uh, subcortical, uh, slightly deep white matter in the predominantly in the frontal and parietal lobes. Again, 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 see some the anterior basal ganglia has some areas of flow corresponding ADC sequence signals. The thalamus also is again symmetrical areas of flow signal changes on the ADC sequences. Uh, T2s, uh, the main findings are actually on the diffusion and ADC. So the T2s, they, there is some degree of hyperintensity, but yeah, the predominant changes can be appreciated on the diffusion and ADC sequences. Uh, some degree of uh, prominent polio space in the vermis, uh, possibly some degree of atrophy or sulcal widening in the frontal regions and the temporal regions. Corpus callosum is mildly thinned out over there, and um, nothing on the um, corresponding to the thalamic lesions. There was no necrosis or is hemorrhagic uh, changes uh, with the corresponding thalamic abnormalities um, on the SWAS sequences. 
post contrast study was done and there was no abnormal intracranial enhancement on the post contrast studies. The MRA, the quality is not uh, great, but I can possibly appreciate some degree of um, some possibly a beaded appearance in the middle cerebral arteries over there. Um, the source, I don't have the source image, the source images, but yeah, the MIP images, there's some degree of beading um, in the uh, middle cerebral arteries predominantly over there. At least on the MRI findings, I thought the subcortical white matter could possibly resemble um, the ALERD pattern or ASD pattern, but the uh, seizure history of three weeks uh, and um, uh, the scan done after three weeks possibly did not correlate uh, with the imaging findings. Um, we had a case series of uh, deep gray nuclear involvement with the ALERD pattern, but again, uh, the symptom onset and the scanning was more acute or say, in the early subacute stage. Uh, the epilepsy syndromes, uh, given the childhood epilepsy, can also have these thalamic abnormalities and the subcortical uh, changes. The only concern was, are these also related to hypoxia, given the thalamic abnormalities and the basal ganglia abnormalities? But uh, I thought maybe for hypoxia, uh, the ventral thalami are more commonly involved. The posterior putamen rather than the anterior basal ganglia were more commonly involved. And the tracts or the periodontic regions were relatively spared, uh, whereas these were changes predominantly in the subcortical uh, regions. Um, so there may be a component of hypoxia, but I think there's something else going on. Um, and the, I thought of a possibility of uh, palsy, liver, mitochondrial disorder. So I think liver enzymes uh, was normal. There was no acute derangement. Is that right, Prithuja? It was normal. Okay. Um, so yeah, these were the possibilities I thought of. Uh, and no toxicity, no uh, medication-related uh, abnormalities, I guess. Not no, that no, that yeah. no, sir. yeah, so I'll open the case. Um, uh, for the panelists, if they think it's only hypoxia related changes or there's something else going on. Nihal, can it be a just a delayed hypoxia because uh, subcortical white matter is involved? Mm -hmm. Delayed post hypoxic delayed matter, matter, yeah. yeah. So, so delay in uh, this white matter delayed hypoxia. And along with that, uh, if you see uh, the, the striatum is involved as well as the ventral thalamus is involved bilaterally. Yeah. Hypoxia definitely is a possibility, I think. Yeah, the only question they asked was, uh, is it only hypoxia or is something else uh, other than together with hypoxia was the question. Yeah. That'd be very difficult. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is also a problem with postmortem findings. We do postmortem imaging and also pathology. And one of the things is we have hypoxia superimposed, very hard to parse out which one's which. This looks more like hypoxia. We didn't have no history and just showed you this case. The only the unusual thing is it's more like frontal predominant. The cortex is not affecting the posterior circulation much. And your MRA is kind of interesting. Is that a secondary feature to the hypoxia? Or is that like real? I don't know. I mean, it looks a little irregular. I do buy that. But um, I, I think hypoxia is the main feature here. And uh, SEN1A is, um, you know, uh, would be to think of, I've, I've, we have we get cases of Dravet syndrome, for example, where we have done postmodern imaging. And the main things you see are post, like, you know, hypoxic changes hippocampus, uh, et cetera, but they are usually from the seizures. Seizure-related change is also possible. And the other thing is here, the EEG, was it frontal predominant? Was there a pattern before the hypoxia? That's the only other clue you can see is if you know before the set of epilepticus where the seizure coming from, that's the area you would concentrate and see if you can find anything else. And the only things we have found in some of these cases, you will find some hippocampal abnormalities, which are kind of hidden under the uh, hypoxia. Um, and you can find some bilamination, et cetera, in the uh, dentate gyrus, but that's very hard unless you do pathology. And imaging, you're pretty much, it's like seeing fibrosis in the lung. It masks what was actually happening before. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, is more likely than this, this abnormality doesn't seem to be, like fires also would be more focal. This is very diffuse, and like Bijoy said, it, it is affecting the basal ganglia. That would be very unusual. Uh, mitochondrial workup. So I think that this is the whole exam which they have sent, I guess. Is that right? Or okay. um, Pituja? This is the one. Uh, so the uh, exam sequencing showed there was a heterozygous deletion of 1.6 MB at the cytoband of ARR2Q243. So this is related to, uh, this was related to SCN1A mutation, deletion mutation. Okay. Uh, so uh, that was our questions, like the Im imaging findings as a child was already on ventilator, had hypoxic episode. Mm -hmm. So was that imaging finding related to the hypoxic injury that this child attained, or was it due to the mutation that the child already had? That was the question to the radiologist from us. 
Uh, CN1A is normal in many cases. You don't see it very much, and you see seizure-related changes in most cases anyway. You do see occasional dysplasias. SN1A is one year, but not SN2B is the one I remember for like more uh, abnormal things. I think this is more hypoxia. This does not look like a, a primary process. Of course, those areas probably more prone, like they're prone to seizures from the CN1A. But what you see here is you're seeing hypoxia, not the genetic, genetic uh, um, phenotype. Uh, Manifestation. Okay. And Nihal, that at top angiography, unless the resolution is really high, this beaded appearance can be artifactually seen. Yeah, yeah that's what In this case, uh, the posterior yeah. circulation, you can do the PCS are really beaded compared to MCS. Mm. So I don't know whether it is pathological or is it really there or it's, it's an artifact. I think it's more artifactual. Yeah. I agree. Uh, source uh, probably. Yeah, source would have been better, I guess. All right. Um, thanks. And thank we'll move on to our last case, Hina. Uh, yes, sir. So this is an 11-year-old uh, boy who had a normal antenatal and perinatal history and normal developmental till, uh, development uh, till one year of age when he had an episode of fever and two episodes of seizures. Uh, after this episode, uh, he, was, he was treated in the local hospital. He went back home. And in the span of uh, next one month, he lost all the milestones. That, that is, he became bed bound. He was not even able to uh, hold his neck, even though the cognitive, even cog even though cognitively he was slightly better, he was still having, he still retained his social smile and eye contact. Uh, then uh, over the next few years, I mean, uh, from one year till now, he slowly gained all his milestones back, uh, but his vision uh, started deteriorating. And now he has only light perception. So, um, uh, and also it started, uh, started to have intermittent breakthrough seizures. On, uh, so the seizures are actually pretty well controlled. In between, he has one or two episodes of breakthrough seizures and he's well controlled on levipil and, and um, clobazam. On examination, he has a normal head circumference. Fundus is pale with, the op uh, with uh, uh, fundus is having a pale optic disc and he's having his roving eye movements. He has uh, bilateral spasticity more in the lower limbs as compared to the upper limbs uh, with increased uh, deep tendon reflexes and an ankle clonus. So uh, from the investigation point of view, at present, he's able to walk on his own uh, with support. I mean, he walks with a walker. He is socially uh, well, re socially as well as cognitively preserved. Uh, he uh, understands spoken language. He can also uh, respond to complex uh, uh, commands and he can almost speak everything fluently uh, except for a few uh, vowels. Okay. Um, uh, the vision is still uh, uh, vision is still bad. However, he has not had any further episodes of any uh, decompensation. Okay. So uh, when he was evaluated at one year, uh, his blood lactates were uh, elevated. Uh, okay. That we'll have, we'll have a look at the scan first. Sure. <laughs> All right, so this is in 2014. Um, again, confluent uh, white matter abnormalities on the t weighted sequences, uh, also involving the corpus callosum over here. Uh, again, periventricular deep subcortical extension, uh, frontoparietal regions, temporal lobes, um, uh, is uh, demonstrating extensive white matter abnormalities. Brainstem is normal. The basal ganglia thalamide did not demonstrate any signal changes. Um, there's possibly some degree of uh, worm in uh, atrophy. But again, nothing significant in the posterior fossa. Um, and then the diffusion has yeah, striking abnormalities of uh, peripheral areas of vestibular diffusion with some, it, I think the central regions are more uh, corresponding with these demyelinating foci. And here again, the extensive white matter abnormalities with peripheral areas of vestibular diffusion um, seen also the corpus callosum is again involved. And then I think this is the follow-up scan um, done how many years later, uh, Ina? Uh, this was done 10 years later. Okay, so 10 years later, this is from... The... was done 2014 when he was one year old. Okay. And this was yeah. done when he was 11 2023, all right. Yes. Um, so, oh, sorry, so these are the old images. Uh, again, these are the T1 flares, and you can appreciate uh, the cavitating extensive glucoencephalotypi type pattern. Uh, on the satellite images, I don't see, I don't know if it's clear enough, but the corpus callosum is involved, predominantly involving the, the central aspects of the middle blade. On the corresponding flared kernels, you can again appreciate these cavitating uh, wave factory changes uh, of cavitating glucoencephalotype type pattern. 
And again, on the follow-up scan in 2023, uh, you have again white matter changes, but there is some degree of volume loss. Periventricular white matter volume is reduced. You can see the cortex is almost reaching up to the uh, these deep brain nuclear structures. Uh, the thalami also are demonstrating thalamic degeneration. There is some valerian degeneration possibly along the internal capsules. Um, on the flares, you can again see the cavitatory refractory changes. Um, the again thalamus is reduced in volume. The diffusion weight sequences in comparison to the first scan, there are only uh, some areas, patchy areas in the frontal lobes, uh, the frontal white matter, and also in the posterior limb of internal capsules. Uh, no hemorrhage or calcification over there on the uh, SWA sequences. And spectroscopy, this is the, fo uh, the follow-up scan. We don't have a spectroscopy on the initial study. Um, possibly a minor lack, mild degree of uh, lack, inverted lactate over there in the white matter, the rarefied white matter. Uh, other than that, I think NA is slightly elevated, but um, I'm, I'm not sure if that is, uh, again, significant. But yeah, there is some degree yeah. of mild elevation of NA, I guess. And then, with, as uh, Sanjay has pointed out in the earlier cases, uh, the diffusion weighted sequences uh, can be helpful in leukodystrophies. Um, I think well, the these are the typical examples demonstrating uh, diffusion changes. Uh, I think our case possibly fits into the mitochondrial spectrum of disorders, they usually have these peripheral areas of restricted diffusion, whereas the finishing white matter, the homocysteine areas have more central abnormalities. Uh, Canavan's disease also can have uh, deep brain nuclear involvement. The primary hypomyelinating disorder uh, does not have any restricted diffusion typically. And then if you narrow down the diagnosis, we are thinking of uh, primarily the first differential was uh, a mitochondrial leukodystrophy, a cavitating leukoencephalopathy, uh, given these uh, almost similar changes which are seen in our case. The other differentials uh, was vanishing white matter, but I think, again, the diffusion changes are slightly different than what we see in a vanishing white matter. The corpus callosum involvement can also be possibly a clue. Uh, I think in vanishing white matter, the inner blade is more commonly involved, whereas in mitochondrial disorders, as seen in our case, the middle blade is more uh, predominantly involved. I, so I don't have a diagnosis, but uh, I think we primarily the differential was raised off um, uh, mitochondrial leukodystrophy. And uh, just so, to... Can just you comment add, on the optic now? Optic nerve, let's see. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have an optic nerve sequence. Let's see. Okay, maybe over here, yeah. Um, I, mm, not clearly, but I think it's possibly optic atrophy over there, um, at least on this sequence. And I think I've just forgot on the sagittal sequence on the follow-up scan. Okay, I don't think I put that up, but on the follow-up scan, the sagittal sequence, the cervical cord also was hyperintense. There was long segment uh, uh, hyperintensity. Yeah. Yeah, I'll open the case for, for the comments now. We don't have a diagnosis yet. Whether we can further narrow down to uh, the complex one and three mm -hmm. or uh, multiple mitochondrial enzymes or, or the cavitating or cavitating can be seen in almost all mitochondria. I think the iron sulfur cluster, uh, yeah, as you have said, cavitating genes are, yeah. I think these were the uh, genes from this paper commonly presented with cavitating leukoencephalopathies. There's a comment on succinate dehydrogenase. There's no succinate peak at around 2.4. So I think uh, the complex two might be uh, down in the differential. And when spectroscopy is done in mitochondrial, I think we should put the voxel in the uninvolved area. Uninvolved, yeah. Because yeah. uh, if you involved area, any any pathology yeah. lactate. And is it really a lactate peak? It's kind of very tiny. Yeah, and this is in the really in I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. The initial usually when I see something like that, always repeat it. Like do another area, and we do three three D MRS anyway. But I would check in other areas too, just to confirm. It's very, very tiny, uh, and but definitely this looks mitochondrial uh, being number one. Uh, I think uh, NFU1, I think I have a case like this. Um, but uh, lact and lact and lactic acid levels? Now the lactic and lactate is normal, but at the initial scan, the lactate was elevated. It was elevated, okay. Yeah. Okay. Was that the yeah, CSF no, lactate or the serum? Uh, so the CSF lactates were normal. It was 2.2. Uh, but the blood lactates were elevated uh, when the first scan was done. It was 4 uh, millimoles per liter. Uh, anything on the alanine? Plasma alanine? 
Uh, the TMS and GCMS uh, reports came back normal. Uh, that was done uh, at for when the child was one year old. They also uh, went ahead. They had uh, evaluated the child in enhance, and they also went ahead with the biopsy. The biopsy came normal, muscle biopsy. With complexes also, is it? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, but we're still thinking mitochondrial. I think um, I think the panel, we all agree. Tina, maybe I think uh, yeah, check for mitochondrial genes as uh, Dr. Bijar and Dr. Sanjay has also mentioned. Yeah. Yes, sir. We'll do that. All right. I quickly okay. Yeah. The only other question was um, if Sanjay or Dr. Bijar can take it up. The child as clinically is uh, improving or better. Is that right, Tina? Yes, sir. He has, uh, like, the, after that initial decompensation, he has uh, consistently uh, gained milestones, okay. uh, except for the vision. The vision has lost. He has lost completely. But then he uh, now is able to walk on his own, uh, mm -hmm. walk with uh, support, with a walker. And uh, with other activities also, uh, because of the vision impairment, he uh, he's having problems. But he can actually, uh, he's well-preserved well cognitively. Yeah, mitochondrial can do that. If you're a mitochondrial cocktail, I've seen patients improve remarkably. Um, and your list, I would turn back side, upside down. The mitochondria is more common that I see. The stem cell transplants, obviously, with treatment. But the one thing I would say is mitochondria can go up and down. You can get good, good times, bad times. If the kid gets a decompensation for infection, et cetera, they can get worse. But in between periods, they can look much better than they looked before. Um, so this list is a good one. Um, and we do stem cell transplants here. So we see the X or the look at the local dystrophies remarkably, you know, to be improved. Even the MRI scans look improved. Yeah. yeah. So, Hina, I think that answers your question. Um, yes, sir. So, yeah. I have one follow up, but I think I'll probably take that up for the next session because I think we're over time. Um, so, yeah, that does, that's our cases. I think uh, once again, uh, Thanks, Sanjay. Thanks, Dr. Vijay, um, and also the people in the chat who have helped us out uh, in these cases. And we'll meet again on the 7th of July. And if you want to submit your cases, you can just email me, and the last date will be uh, 5th of July. So, yeah. Thank you, Nihal. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Learned a lot, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.